My name is Danita Red. I'm professor of counseling here at Moore Park College. I'd like to welcome you here to our event. If you did not get a copy of the handout we have for you, it is along the wall right outside of the door here. So make sure you get a copy of the handout. Our question for today is for good education, avoid the Ivy League? That's just a question. Uh, this event is for the year of myth and reality, where across disciplines, we are exploring the myths and misperceptions in our society. Today's discipline is counseling. You are uh, participating in a seminar, uh, and a seminar is an exchange of information. I'm going to forward the slides for you a little bit. So uh, a seminar is an exchange of information, and the speakers are ready to share and help you in the exchange of information. On the handout, the very first page is a questionnaire. As we go through the seminar while the speakers are talking, it's okay to fill in your responses on the questionnaire. There's another question we thought of uh, just a few minutes ago that you might want to jot down somewhere. If you remember how many units you've completed exactly or an approximate number, go ahead and jot that down somewhere on the questionnaire. We will not collect it from you, but you'll use it to, uh, to ask questions and express your opinions and beliefs uh, as we go through the seminar today. So how to participate. The speakers will talk for a few minutes, and then we'll open the floor up to questions and answers, opinions, beliefs, myths, realities, whatever you have to say and to express, you'll be able to do that uh, during the seminar. As people are coming in, would you, some of you, would you do me a favor? And there's handouts in the back along the wall, just, yes. And if someone comes in and you see they don't have a handout, all of you, just direct them to pick one up uh, from the back of the wall there. Uh, to, about busty myths. Today we hope to debunk our uh, bus myths that impede aspects of your education, namely choosing a major and transferring. And you may be wondering if we are really saying to avoid the Ivy League are other prestigious universities? And the answer to that will come later. I'm not going to answer it right now. And before I introduce the speakers, let me tell you a little bit about Moore Park College. Some of you may not reali realize this, but Moore Park College is a com uh, community college that has been identified as one of the top community colleges in the country. There's over a thousand, uh, actually it should be over a thousand three hundred uh, community colleges. And we're ranked number 35. So you may not realize that. We also have one of the highest transfer rates in the country. So <laughs> today, as I mentioned a, about a minute ago, that we're going to talk about myths and realities as they relate to transferring and to choosing a major. The reality is, is there's not always a yes or no right or wrong answer. Sometimes it's in the middle. Sometimes it's by your personal taste, what is right or wrong, or it's really what is best for you. And in some cases, yes, there are right and wrong, but most of the time it's really not a right or wrong, or a yes or no answer. Okay, so first I would like to present to you Professor Munoz from Ventura College. And uh, let me just read to you a little bit about her background. She's the Extended Opportunity Program and Services, EOPS Coordinator at Ventura Community College. She has served on the California Community College's EOPS Association Board as president, as regional governor of the Faculty Association of the California Community Colleges Board, 
and on the Committee of Political Education. She has served as chair of the American Federation of Teachers, Local 1828, that's our local one in Ventura County, and she served as a senator on the Ventura College Academic Senate. Even today, I received notice in a newsletter about some of the work she is doing to help the faculty of this district. She is truly an activist for students and for her colleagues. Professor Munoz Paula is a local girl returned to work for us. She is a native of Ventura and attended Ventura College. She transferred to CSU Northridge, double majored, and graduated with bachelor's degrees in sociology and Chicano studies. She transferred to the University of Wisconsin Whitewater where she completed a master of science degree in counseling and guidance and fulfilled her additional mission of establishing the beginnings of a UW Whitewater Chicano Studies program. While at CSUN, she became involved with MECHA which is a stu Latino student organization. The Mecha student newspaper named El Popo uh, was started while she was there. She was in La Ch Chicana Student Group, which is an organization of the, f uh, well, it was an organization, the f a new organization at the time for first, uh, for Chicana student uh, conference. And she was editor of the first CSUN uh, Mecha Latina newspaper, El Popo Feminel. Professor Munoz also became involved with Latino community organizations upon moving back to Ventura. She was active and served on numerous committees and organizations where she also usually served as chair or president. Her parents were both Mexican immigrants and agricultural laborers. She grew up in a Mexican bracero camp. Her first language was Spanish, and as she learned English, she was put to good use by her parents to translate and interpret for the Spanish-speaking speaking Mexican laborers. Professor Munoz still considers EOPS her dream job, and it has always been an honor to serve as an educator, she says as an advocate, and as an EOPS director. She believes that no other community college program has succeeded or accomplished what EOPS has done, done in California. For the millions of educationally and economically disadvantaged college students that it has served, it has done a, an outstanding job over the years since it was established in 1969. Our second speaker, Dr. Lisa Rothman is co-author of the Career Fitness Program. For my students who are here, that is your textbook. Remember I mentioned her to you? Exercising Your Options. It's by uh, Pearson Education Publishers. It is a popular career book used in community colleges and universities. It's been used since 1989, and it's now about to come out in its 11th edition. The book is an international bestseller best and is used as a textbook in 13 countries. Her college positions have included faculty development coordinator and dean of counseling at El Camino College, as well as an instructor and a co coordinator of career centers at two different colleges, El Camino College and here at Moore Park College. She left Moore Park College for El Camino about 17 or 18 years ago, it was. She currently writes a blog for career thought leaders. Additionally, she is involved with her professional organizations, including the California Career Development Association, where she is the president-elect, and the National Career Development Association. And I'm just going to advance the slide. <laughs> she is the PR director for the Asian Pacific Career Development Association. She is also past president 
of the Los Padres American Society for Training and Development and the California Community College Counselors Association, which was known as 4CA. Her doctoral degree is from the University of California at Los Angeles, that's UCLA, in higher education, work, and adult development. Her master's degree is in counseling and is from California State University at Los Angeles with a specialization in community college counseling and vocational rehabilitation counseling. In 2014, earlier this year, I believe it was in June, she received an outstanding award from the National Career Development Association. It was actually, the group is called national, but it's international. 22 countries belong to the NCDA. She was uh, given the award for Outstanding Career Practitioner Award. All right, so we're going to get started with choosing a major. And Professor Munoz, Paula, is going to start. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having us here. Um, I would like to know how many of you are students. If you raise your hand, how many students are there? Okay. Okay. Well, um, I would like to say to you that if you, of uh, the students, if you were to come to see me, I'm not a counselor right now. I'm a coordinator, but I do have students in my program that come to see me for many other many reasons. But I think if you were to come to see me. I probably could, you would talk to me about what is, what do you, what should your career be? What should your major be? And I think that I probably would say, you know, I can look at you and I could just see in you by your aura what you should be. And I will tell you what you should be. Okay? Because I can do that just from talking to you and just a small little exchange. I can do that. <laughs> No, that's not going to happen, okay? But I think that many times students come to us and they want us to somehow magically lead them down the path to what should their major be, what should their career be. And I wish we could do that, and we joke about that a lot in on my EOPS program with the other two counselors that I have, that you know, students do come to us seeking that kind of insight and answers for us, and we just don't have that magic crystal ball. So it really is going to take a lot of work on the student's part to figure that out. Um, so that's going to be the emphasis of, of my presentation is really that we can guide you, but a lot of the work is going to come from you. So um, choosing a major, um, there are a lot of places that you can, we will direct you to. Um, this is for Moorpark College. We have the same kind of things at, at uh, Ventura College. There are sites that you can be directed to to kind of explore what, kind of, what are the careers out there. You know, there's so many careers that <coughs> students don't know about. Students end up, we find, going into a lot of the same majors, you know, sociology, psychology, and, you know, their world is not, they don't have a large world view. So unless you go here and you look at all the different careers there are, students sometimes don't have a big world view. So they limit themselves into just a few majors that they know their, or careers that they know their friends are going to go into. Can I have the next slide? So, um, well, actually the first slide was the one I wanted. Could I do? Um, choosing a major and choosing a career are not the same thing. For, for, for example, um, you might um, choose to be an English major, but maybe you're not going to be an English teacher. Um, with the English major, there's many things you can be. You might end up being an attorney. So there's all kinds of different majors that you can go into that is not necessarily going to go into that kind of a career. So that exploration should come with your Moore Park College counselor. And there are sites for you to look at all the different careers and the majors. And you will see that a particular major is not going to necessarily end up being your career. For example, I was a sociology Chicano studies major. Um, I double majored, but I ended up getting a master's in counseling and guidance, and I knew that I was probably going to become a counselor at some kind of community college. For me, it worked. For me, it was just boom, boom, boom. First graduated from uh, Wisconsin, and that same month got a job at Ventura College. So for me, it worked out very well. Um, but I started off exploring um, 
sociology because I thought I wanted to go into probation. Thank God I did not because I, I, I would just not have liked it because I thought I wanted to change the world. I wanted to be a probation officer and I thought I was going to do that. But I was able to intern. And so, I, uh, you know, interning is very healthy because then you get to intern and see what it's all about. So I thought that by being a probation officer, I was going to change the world of all my little Latino gangbangers and delinquents. Until I interned and went to the East LA um, kind of CYA facility, and I walked with my Anglo probation officer, who I was interning with, through this field. And we were in the middle of thousands of Latino youth. They were all offenders. And as I walked through there, I thought, what do I think I'm going to do to change this? Zero, nothing. So that was a big eye-opener for me. And I probably would not have had that experience if I had not interned and experienced it. So I thought, no, this is not what I want to do. I'm not going to be able to change, make any change here. I don't want to be a law enforcement officer. I want to do something different. So I think interning is an excellent um, way to go. Okay, number two. Um, and, and this applies here also. Choosing the sociology, Chicano studies major didn't mean that I was going to necessarily end up there, I, although I am glad I double majored because it gave me breath. I knew that with Chicano studies, um, there weren't going to be any Chicano studies jobs. I knew that at that time. With sociology, I thought, well, I would, I would probably go into some kind of uh, work, maybe probation, I was thinking then, uh, maybe a counselor. But it doesn't mean that that's going to limit you. But I think double majoring now, for example, students that are um, music majors, they may decide that uh, we just had a student right now who's a music major, and we've gone to his concerts. Um, he tries really hard. He's not the star musician. Um, but we go and we support him in his concerts. He's finally realized that, you know, he's not the star musician he wants to be, so now he's going to do the history. Thank God he is in his one year and a half where he can still make up those history classes and still major in history. So he will have, he will live his love of music, but he will pursue history somehow, and he's not sure how he's going to do it but he loves history. So we believe that he will be successful and he's going to be transferring um, as a music history major. But he's keeping both interests. He's going to keep both interests, yes. Um, next slide. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of it now, but you know there is a push with a 3SP program coming through the Community Colleges, the Student Success Act, um, in initiated by the legislators and financial aid now that students don't have as much time as they had to to play around with majors and coursework and stay, you know, really explore um, your classes in a longer time frame at the community colleges. Your time is limited in terms of financial aid, so you don't have that much time. And uh, the push is for you to declare a major the first year. So those are external pressures on students to decide your, on your major quickly. Um, so if you have any inclination on a major, then that's good for you because you're going to get started on finishing sooner. If you don't explore that, it is going to take you a, a little bit longer. And so you might consider how is that going to affect you if you're a financial aid student? How is it going to affect you um, in terms of you wanting to be in school longer? So if you have a, some kind of a clue, then you should ex explore it. Um, I think it's really good for you to take courses in your area of interest. Um, you will have to do your own research. I think the counselors are available to help you. But the reality is it's going to really be on you to, to explore that. There's no one that's going to be able to tell you what you should do. One other point is to take your G GE classes and pick the ones you are really interested in taking first. If they don't have a sequence, take, take a history class if you thought you wanted to be a history major. Take your English, you have to take it anyway, ta it so that you can get to literature and see if you want to really get into literature. Take your physics intro class and see if you want to get into physics. Take some of the ones that catch your imagination first. And then you know you're going to have to do the rest of the general ed. And I've seen a lot of students who are really uh, afraid of general ed. They don't want to take some extra classes 
that don't count for their major. But sometimes it's the general ed that will open you up to a whole new universe. And if you have an inclination of what you want to do, then um, you'll be able to take your major preparation and get through sooner. So I'm going to emphasize here that it's critical you work with the counselor. Do not rely on your friends. Um, you can use a catalog and look at what's required, but you know, there's just so many little things that you may not know that are not there that will affect your transferring to a particular university. So you know, use your college resources. Next slide. And that's seek expert advice. <laughs> that, that, those are the counselors. Those uh, are not your friends. Um, but um, look at places that you could intern. Uh, talk to professionals who are in the field. So, you know, you have to really do your homework and you have to do the re research. I can't emphasize that enough. You're not going to get it just by researching it sometimes on your own unless you know for sure in your heart that that's what you want to do. So what I tell students many times is if you could be do anything, what would it be? You know, without putting any kind of limitations, expenses, um, barriers for yourself, what is it that you would want to do if you could do anything? And a lot of times the students know what they want to do, but they just don't think that that's, they can do it. They can't achieve it. They don't want to dream. They don't want to be fearless. They are afraid, and so they don't want to go there. So I think <coughs> students can look in within yourself, and in there somewhere, you kind of know what you want to do. So I always say, don't be afraid. Be fearless and just go for it. Next slide. Um, which is a self-analysis, and, and, and yes, we do have inventories at the college and where you can take an inventory test, you can look at your values, your interests, your, you can look at your skills, personality types, but really, it's going to come down to what is going to make you happy, what are you going to be happy doing? Is it going to be a job you're going to want to go to every day? What is going to make your heart pitter-patter? What, what do you really love doing? I know that as for as many years as I've been in EOPS, I look forward to going to my job. It's not a chore for me. It's a labor of love. I look forward to going to that job every day. So I think that we encourage students to look for that. That is what's going to motivate and drive you. And um, if it's to be a scientist and more power to you, you're going to be making a lot of money and it's going to be a rough major, but you know what? If you want to do it, then you'll do it, regardless of how tough you think the courses are. Can I make a comment? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. I for a while, I worked at the Brain Research Institute at UCLA. I did research. And some of the people I worked with there loved what they were doing. They could, some of them were uh, in their 80s and in their 90s, and they were still doing research. They weren't doing it for the money. They were doing it because it was their passion. So that's what, you know, what, you're, what she's talking about here. Think about what you're going to do that you want to do, whether or not you get paid for it. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, although, uh, you know, pay is important. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so, um, it is. you know, we do have students who come in that maybe think um, they just want to be medical assistants. So, and that's because they're coming from their worldview is not a broad worldview. Uh, maybe they just barely graduated high school with, uh, you know, 1.75. So maybe they feel, you know, I'm going to just do this one semester training medical assistant, and then I'll go get a job. Maybe two semesters. So, you know, we say to them, okay, have you explored the job market and what the pay is? I mean, have you looked at what, are, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? Do you want to plan to have children? Do you plan to own a home? Have you looked at how much that costs? Um, are you planning to get married? Are you planning to be single? What is it that you have planned for your life? And look at how much money you're going to be making as a medical assistant. The reality is you're not going to be making that much money over the long term. Maybe it's a way to get started. Maybe their major is going to change. Maybe they'll come back and work towards being a nurse or something different. But the pay is important. A lot of times our students have no idea what the pay is. And it's, so go it's good if that's going to be your love and you don't care, then, then that's good. Then go for that. But I think it's important to look at what are the salaries for these jobs you, you think you want to pursue. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, there, there are just a few courses requiring specialized degrees, for example, nursing and engineering. The other majors or careers are, are much broader. But for nursing, um, people who want nursing, um, 
it's a good job, they're going to make good money, so they come in and it's going to be a predetermined um, course selection. Um, I think these people are really lucky because they know what they want to do. So they're going to be on that path right away. Um, but there are a few of these areas that have specialized degrees. I can't think of what some of the other ones are right now. Engineering is Well, up engineering there. is up there. But um, there's pre -med. a few of them. Pre-med. Pre-med. But we're going to know is a great, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> but but pre-med is broader. You'll see that. I put a slide about that. Okay. Can we do the next slide? Okay. Um, so this, this, this kind of follows the last slide in that medical st students now are no longer required to be science majors. You can major pretty much in anything. They want a breadth of experience in education. So you could be an English major. There's all kinds of different majors you can be, and then you will be applying to law school. So what used to be is no longer. You can major in, in all kinds of different um, areas and then go into these kind of careers. So as a matter of fact, for med schools, they just changed the uh, MCAT, the Medical College Admissions Test, and they included humanities and social and behavioral sciences on the test. And it, it would be the same to be uh, an attorney it, it can be any major, um, although I think some majors, you know, are stronger in those areas. You know, we have opinions, so it's good to shop around for counselors here on campus. I, I, in our program, we only have two counselors, but we encourage students to meet with both, to shop around to see, maybe they can meet with one or the other each time to see which, you might get different advice and opinion from different counselors. And, I think it's and good to do that. There's always taking a career class where you have to do a lot of research and then you get feedback from your professor about the research you're doing. It's really important to find out if the research you're researching about careers is accurate. There's a lot of websites on the web that look like they're accurate, but they're leading you to some vocational school. So you need to learn from a teacher, a counselor, a professor, how to find the right sites. So the best sites are the sites that the college has on their websites. Mm -hmm. Choosing a major that interests you, that you research, and that you would study for just for fun may be the best choice. There again, it's what is it that you're going to love doing. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. That might be just what you may need to do. Um, so if that's what it isn't, then go with it. There's nothing wrong with that. Studies also show that people who enjoy what they're studying there's kind of two ways of enjoying what you're studying. You enjoy it because it's uh, demanding, uh, exciting to learn new things. It's leading you in a, into being curious about the world. That's one way to look at majors. Another way to look at it is, I, I would read this if it wasn't assigned to me. Now, you, you can't understand all the science if you don't have the background in math and biology and physics and chemistry to read, to understand science. But if you start loving being curious about these disciplines, you will want to keep on studying. You will want to keep on researching. And you find that when you sit in a class and the teacher is super enthusiastic about what they're talking about, you catch that enthusiasm. So those are the kinds of clues that you want to do while you're researching and while you're sitting in class and while you're talking to people who are passionate about what they're teaching. Mm -hmm. okay. Don't be afraid that your major and career choices will determine what you will do for the rest of your life. Um, you know, you have your major and you have your career. That could change. You know, you might start off with something and, and change. We have students who might be CNAs that eventually want to be nurses or people who want to be nurses eventually become doctors. That can change. You know, you have your community college education and you're going to then go on to a four-year and she'll talk about majors more. But you know, there's also your master's, which may be totally different from what you did at undergraduate, and your, car your career could just totally switch. So um, that which, what you will do early on is not going to be necessarily what you're going to do for the rest of your life. It could, it could change. Just as I started off wanting to do one thing, and it switched to something totally different. And if you're going to work until you're 70 to 80 years old, do you see yourself being 
a teacher for the next 60 years? Teachers don't usually last 60 years. So you want to you want to kind of give yourself permission to try out some fields. And usually, right out of college, you don't get the exact perfect job. So you're going to be first getting an internship, then finding out which environment you want to work in, then you're going to start working someplace that doesn't allow you to do everything everybody told you you were going to be allowed to do. And then you're going to figure out how to make it into your own style if you really love what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of work that will be out there when you finish has yet to be invented. So we don't know everything that will be out there because it's not out there yet, but it will be. Mm -hmm. um, a reality check of dreams with abilities, but don't give up too, too early. Um, I, think that, um, I think that if you really want to do something, you'll do it regardless of what you think your abilities are or what the cost is going to be. So, you know, what did, what did Disney say? Dare to dream it. Or if you can dream it, you can do it. And I really believe that. And especially with the students that we work in our program, we're working with the lowest income, most education disadvantaged students. And they're coming to us, some of them not high school graduates, some of them with grade point averages below 2.0. Um, very low income. Their worldview is not a broad one of a big education um, world out there or a lot of different um, careers but you know as they go through our program they develop dreams and we encourage them to go after those dreams so the only one that's going to limit you is yourself so we encourage our students to not limit themselves we encourage them when it comes time to apply to apply to a lot of universities and my thing is don't say no to yourself let somebody else say no to you do not just say, I'm not going to apply because I know they're not going to accept me. No, apply. Let someone else say no to you. So I think here it's just, you know, f go for your dream. Whatever it is, don't be fearless and just go for it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. The career portion, I do want to make a comment. Uh, the former student I worked with. Good job. He kept telling Thanks me, I can do it, I can do it. He kept, he flunked. This was before we had limitations on how many times you could repeat a class. He flunked pre-calculus math seven five times. And he kept telling me he could do it, he could do it, he just wasn't doing his homework, he just wasn't focusing. So about, I would say about three years or four years after I last saw him, he returned to campus one day, he had graduated from UCLA with the Bachelor's of Science in Mathematics. So, <laughs> one of the students from the high school at Moore Park College. I'm going to make a few comments okay. before I turn the uh, floor over to um, Dr. Rothman. So as uh, students of all ages, you know, community colleges, we get people of all ages. We have, I've had students in my class as young as 11 years of age. And I've counseled students regularly in many years past who were 13, 14, and 16 years of age. And then we also have a high school program on our campus. So people come here uh, for usually f uh, one of four reasons or m multiple of, you know, two or three, two of the four. But the main uh, reason uh, everybody's probably here is for personal growth, personal enrichment, and professional uh, development. Somewhere we all fit in the mix, no matter what our goals are. But then there's three main goals uh, students here have. They're earning a, a certificate, are they going to earn an associate's degree, are they going to transfer. And a majority of our students here at Moore Park College will earn an associate's degree and transfer. Moore Park College t uh, has a high transfer rate. I've worked at a, another community college that had one of the lowest transfer rates in the state, but the students who went there were looking for professional development and they were working on certificates and associates, but they weren't necessarily planning to transfer. So more part tends to attract students uh, who want to transfer. So the majority of our students here are transfer oriented, so we're gonna talk to you a little bit about transfer. Uh, Dr. Rothman? 
Okay, so transfer is a big issue. And the majority, like two thirds of every new class that comes into the community college raises their hands and say, I want to transfer. One third say they don't know. The, the, the one third that says they don't know, so maybe a few of them know that they want to be nurses or uh, dental hygienists or something like that where we have specific two-year degrees. But even the ones who raise their hands don't really know because it's kind of like peer pressure to say you're going to transfer. Um, so we're going to talk about the two-year degree and the four-year degree, but we're also going to talk about by the time you're looking into transfer, you have to have a major. You, the transfer schools are not letting people in without majors. Uh, maybe there's some out-of-state schools that might let you in. Uh, maybe there's some private schools that will let you in because they need students. But the, the most reputable schools are asking the community colleges to prepare you for being ready for your junior and your senior year when you get to the next school. So freshman year tends to be 1 to 30 units. Sophomore year is 31 to 60 units. When you transfer, you're supposed to have 60 transferable units, and then you are in your major when you go to the next school. Um, one of the things I did as a uh, high school graduate is I, got, I went on a tour of a college. I had never been out of North Hollywood. I was a local California person, and uh, my mom didn't drive, and my dad was working all the time. And I went on a high school tour to UCLA. The reason why I fell in love with UCLA, nobody told me about UCLA. Nobody told me about their teams and their reputation and how great a school it was, except the teacher who was taking us on the tour. And I hate to say it, but I fell in love with the bookstore, not for the books. They had clothes in the bookstore. And I was just a naive young kid who hadn't been out in North Hollywood. So what, you never know what's going to make an impression on you. I mean, I, I can't even believe that I didn't look at any other school. I had taken some um, advanced placement classes at Valley College, so I knew what the, my local community college was, and that's where I was going to go if I didn't get accepted to UCLA. I don't recommend picking your school that way anymore. Um, however, once I started working at Moore Park College and I got to visit UC Santa Barbara, I fell in love with UC Santa Barbara. And I said, I wish I had somebody had taken me on a tour of UC Santa Barbara because it's a once-in-a-lifetime chance to uh, be in that locale and going to school. Uh, so I often say to students, it's not just the major, it might be the location. Is that the next slide? Yeah, so I'm going into... Is, is it in-state, out-of-state? Is it uh, a public or private? Is it a two-year degree, a four-year degree, an applied degree? So like Cal Poly Pomona and Cal Poly uh, San Luis Obispo have a lot of applied degrees. A lot of the state universities, California state universities, have uh, made their program so that when you get out, you will have a skill in an applied degree. And when you do your research, you will find out what the applied degrees are. So instead of just becoming an engineer, you become an engineering technician, or you become a, uh, a dental hygienist who it has a bachelor's degree. There's so many applied degrees that are very exciting, and I've seen them at the state universities. Uh, you don't see applied degrees at UCs, University of California. University of California is known for academic degrees that are preparing you to get a PhD, I feel like, or higher. They want you to be a researcher. They want you to be curious about the world and to have foundation skills and how to do research. So little did I know when I got into UCLA that I was being prepared to go to graduate school. Nobody in my family had gone to college and I was being prepared to go to graduate school. I accidentally got a work-study job for uh, a, the Career Center. I don't know how long it would have taken me to step in the Career Center if I didn't work there. And, uh, and near my junior year, after being there two years, I finally approached a career counselor. And I said, uh, what could I do with a major in history? Because I don't think I want to be a history teacher. I've noticed that there are students who will fall asleep at the back of the lecture hall. 
really. And I said, I love history, but I can't see myself doing that. And so the career counselor helped me do some exploration, but we didn't really, he, the big point he probably made was, I need to expose myself to a few more occupations. So I wound up volunteering in helping situations, because I was a helping type person, um, every semester I changed jobs. I had these five hour a week volunteer positions. So when you're looking at the schools you want to go to, do they have opportunities for you to get volunteer positions and internships? Read about that on their school site. It's the most important thing you can do with your life. Uh, two-thirds of employers inter uh, hire the people that are their interns. So it's very important to get an internship, and the more you're into a specific area of study, it's even more important. But so uh, by volunteering in, in a school, in a, um, a tu tutoring a kid that had a, a bad psychological profile and I thought he was going to attack me but he didn't. He was really a nice kid but they had labels for people in those days. And then I um, got on UCLA's hotline for suicide prevention and lo and behold I, de I developed this desire to become a counselor. Uh, the training for suicide prevention was so good that I've never had such good training even in my master's degree and in all my certifications. I have a marriage and family license and my best training was UCLA's uh, Suicide Prevention Center. So you don't know what, that was my senior year that I found that out. And what I found out is I wanted to work with adults, not with kids, because I had volunteered with kids. So trial and error has a lot to do with it. Uh, Danita talks about happenstance theory. You happen to be at the right place at the right time and you meet somebody who's going to motivate you and, and get you charged up. So ask your teachers and ask everybody you know about what school they went to to get where they're at and find out if their enthusiasm about their school could influence you to start looking up, t up the school. Do we want to go to the virtual tour? visit as many colleges, the visit as many colleges. So we want you to visit as many colleges as possible. If your college doesn't have organized tours to um, different college campuses, I worked at El Camino College that had like 30,000 students and we had five trips to different colleges each semester, as well as the transfer fair. You get a really good idea about the schools at the transfer fair. You'll never pick up better information than at the transfer fair. So be sure to utilize the transfer fair, but if there, sometimes the schools arrange for you to come to their campuses too. So always look into that. And then online you can do virtual tours. Um, but I say, if you're standing in line at a movie, ask the person in front of you if they got a college degree and what they're doing with it. It will open you up to what are the possibilities. Because we always hear the bad news, but we don't hear the good news. Um, I once asked a student here who was, um, he, I think he delivered mail. And I said, well, when you see people with fancy cars outside of their house, and you see them getting into their Mercedes, ask them what they do for a living. You gotta be curious. You get ideas about your major and your direction and the school you wanna go to by hanging around people who went to those places. And one of the things that Paula had emphasized as we worked on this presentation, at Moore Park College, we don't sponsor field trips to colleges. And so uh, she had uh, recommended that our students get together and go to the Career Transfer Center and ask that uh, a bus is rented and maybe they pay a small fee so that they can visit some of the college campuses. And about that person with the Mercedes, if they don't want to answer you, then you probably just want to leave it alone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, somebody else worked at a car wash. <laughs> but you never know, you have to be uh, a little risk taker. What can they do to you? <laughs> <laughs> Give you, not talk to you, that's what they could do. Well, they may not have gone to college to get that Mercedes, is my point. So. Yeah, we're going to talk about that when we talk about uh, some of the majors. So, ha how many of you, can I have a raise of hand if any of you have heard of assist.org? Good, because that's really the Bible in the counseling center. Uh, helping you with California State uh, 
and UC and some private schools and you can find out exactly, we call it articulation agreements, what agreements we have with what majors and what you have, have to do to get through each major. Um, now, College Navigator, I wanted to say, we, ha we say these are how do you compare one college to another college? What kind of graduation rates do they have? Do you want to go to a college that, that graduates 23% of their students in six years? I looked that up once. I was really kind of surprised. Now, I'll tell you what, why I don't totally believe in looking up th these statistics. I, I totally believe that statistics can be skewed in different ways and you can be looking at it one year and it says one thing and another year it says another thing because they change the algorithms of the statistics and one of the things that that I saw for the 23 percent graduation rate was Cal State Dominguez Hills which uh, my college El Camino was right next door to Cal State Dominguez Hills it was our local feeder college and it didn't have the greatest reputation because of its graduation rates. Well, it turns out that probably 75 to 85 percent of its students are work full time. Maybe, maybe I'm exaggerating, but an awful lot of their students. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of the students are working full time or part time and, and raising families, and they have a very uh, hectic life. So it's very hard to get out of school in six years if you have a full life taking up your time. So there's all kinds of reasons for statistics that some of these don't say. The um, College Navigator uh, had um, a college could have a low graduation rate and high placement into good paying jobs. So the few people that graduate get great jobs and they would be high on College Navigator. So be w if you're not willing to read all the information about why to use this, uh, I just want to say beware. And if you visit the school and get a great impression of it, uh, sometimes your heart will tell you more than the statistics show you. Uh, College Board has a lot of information about schools throughout the United States, really good profiles of schools and student feedback. Um, and then is there an, then I put together a list of, uh, college websites that explore and I really like college measures it's being it says it's from multiple data sources to show schools performance in areas of student success school efficiency and productivity and graduates pay in debt um, how many of you have heard that we have a debt crisis amongst college students uh, we're worried that people are putting so much money into going to school that they won't be able to pay for houses when they get out of school. They won't be able to own their own uh, houses. Or, and and it, it is an issue, but it means that those people didn't plan right. So you want to go to the next slide? So uh, research means research financial aid for yourself. Find out what the real rules of financial aid are. Find out if the financial aid you get here, and if they say you've finished with your financial aid at the community college because you've used up your time that they've allocated to you, you then can go on and have a, another chance at financial aid at the university the, for your junior and senior year. Scholarships, www.scholarships.com, if you don't get the whole uh, piece of that in. I just put scholarships.com and thought it was a great website. It had so much information about evaluating what scholarships you can get given your major or given the school you want to go to. You can search by school and you can search by major. Uh, now the big thing, we, we titled this, should you go to an Ivy League? I mean, do you want, anybody here want to go to an Ivy League? A prestigious school like UCLA? Or UC Berkeley? <laughs> UC Berkeley, I will even say USC. USC is tremendous. Um, El Camino College is a little bit closer to USC than we are here. But when I was here, a lot of people wanted to go to USC. One of my USC stories is uh, I was the business counselor and the business student uh, decided that he didn't really like being a business major. He was going to get into something that was a little bit more artsy. And so he took graphic arts as a major. <laughs> And this was in the 90s, and he had like a 3.5 GPA. It wasn't high enough for SC. So he stayed here an extra year, got his certificate in graphic arts, because his big dream was to have a business. And the business was going to be media and graphics. <laughs> and 
the second year he was here staying and taking all the extra classes, he became student body president. When you stay here three years, you can become student body president. And he got into SC the next year. So there's novel ways to get into the college of your dream. And you just need to dream big and have some some research you've done on other people who've done it. When you visit a college, you can ask about their visiting, uh, their students, visiting their alumni. They, they've got all kinds of websites where they talk about their schools. <coughs> now, if you can read this, uh, the most important thing is to say that a lot of schools are selective. Uh, you can have, like Berkeley is pretty selective, 27%. Got, got accepted. I mean, so what, what do counselors say? And I've had students do this. I had a student who changed from being a business major to being a American studies major. And he got into Berkeley with a 3.8 GPA. Business was like 4.0 and, and a lot of extracurricular activities. But American studies was a little bit less, and he, he wanted to go to Berkeley. That was the end all. So you got to weigh what the major means to you versus what the school means to you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you might pick it because of the school. Now, we were, we were making the statement about Ivy League colleges. Look at the way they select their students. They must have hundreds of thousands of people applying, and they only let in very small classes. They are small schools. They're not like UCLA. They don't tend to have 30,000 or 35,000. They will have a classroom of 20 to 30, probably 20 is, is more likely in these kind of schools. So it's smaller groups are getting in, and most of the freshmen who get in are from prep schools in the East Coast. But we do get some Californians into yes. these schools too. Mm -hmm. But from the community college, you can transfer in. It's a slightly different rate. It's not as low a percentage. Um, now, what, what time and memorial, we have more CSUs in the state, so they have more room for more students. And this shows you how many of our students go to the Cal State University versus the University of California versus in-state private versus out of state. It's about a, a half of the students from community colleges statewide gone to Cal State University. And then there's a r another really big reason for that. We, when I said location, 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 that's what they say about jobs and starting your businesses. Uh, how far away are you willing to go? Do you really want to get out of California? Do you really want to get away from your family? D what, what does away from your family mean? My family was in North Hollywood and I was 45 minutes away going to UCLA and I was away from my family. It was, I, I lived in a dorm, I lived in a sorority, and I lived in an apartment. And I didn't have to go home. I also didn't have a car, but I had an excuse not to go home. <laughs> so there's all kinds of a way. Uh, and so I, I meet a lot of students who really don't want to go that far away. Uh, one student had a choice between UC Berkeley and UCLA, and she lived in Torrance. And she had a dream of Berkeley for the longest time. But once she was accepted, she decided she didn't want to go away. <laughs> UCLA was it. So you never know. It's kind of like, where is your heart when you get your acceptance letters? And what you make of the college experience is probably more important than what college you go to. Because every college has specialties. And every college has different offices. So this whole thing about study abroad, uh, getting scholarships, uh, having internships, uh, offices that uh, help you with your science major. We call it MESA programs or STEM programs. Every college has those kind of programs. Guess what? Only a small percentage of students use the programs. So if you're at a school that isn't known for everything, but they have those programs, you can be one of the few who, who use the program. And so Dominguez Hills has a great medical research program. Their students get to uh, do research at uh, local hospitals in the summer. Not every other college has that research experience. They've been chosen. Um, Dominguez Hills has an orthotics program. That's for fake limbs and fake legs. It's one of two schools in the United States 
Who would know? But so sometimes during your research, you can find a related field at a college and hardly anybody knows about it. Just because uh, hardly anybody knows about it, it's, it's still a very highly selective program. So you have to get the experience to get in the program. Um, so the ideal is that you've done enough research that you know what you want and you will put the extra time into being the best that you can be. Again, the studies all show that people who get excited about school when they're in college will stay excited about learning the rest of their life. If you're in a major where you dread going to the classes but your parents want you to be, you may not become. <laughs> So we want you to become something, and we know that the beginning is getting a degree. Um, they, they also, I saw something where we need, right now we have about 25 to 30 percent of the population that has bachelor's degrees. By the year 2025, it's going to be 40 percent needed in society with bachelor's degrees. It's not because all jobs require bachelor's degrees, it's because employers are demanding that level of critical thinking, that level of research, curiosity, continuous learning. When you come out of high school, you do not feel like continuous learning is what you want to do. Ever hear of senioritis? I hardly meet any students who are at the community college who have, who have sophomoritis. You know, the second year here, the third year here, the fourth year here. Oh, it took me four years to get out of Moore Park College, but I want to stay here. We hear that often. Yes, we do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah, we have to kick you all out. So th the ideal is if you learn to love learning, you'll go on. Now, nobody in my family had graduate degrees. I don't even know how I got that bug for the graduate degree. UCLA, I have to blame because they taught me how to be a researcher, and, and they didn't teach me how to finish my, career, my major and just be finished. They taught me to want to learn more. And from all my exploration, I wanted to learn more about counseling. How did I go from a history major to a counseling master's? You didn't need to have a psych degree to get into counseling. You don't need a psych degree to get into psychology as a master's degree or a doctorate. So my husband is a psychologist, and he had an anthropology degree, undergraduate. So graduate school, you can catch up with what you missed, the preparation for getting into a graduate school after you get your degree, but you have to really know, what, by then you really know what you want to do. You have much more insight because you're older and wiser at age, what is it, 21 or 24, however long it takes you to get through. And also the older you get, the easier your courses will get, believe it or not. <laughs> so. so, I think. Okay, and we consider the cost? You, you talked okay, about some, that. Yeah, financial okay. aid, yeah, I think we talked about with scholarships. Oh, I did find, I do have one, one additional resource for financial aid. I found a, a, something called Project on Student Debt. Project on Student Debt. And I'm going to give Danita the piece of paper where, where you can look up what schools, how much debt students leave the school with. And they have schools all over the United States. And then there's, a, and the average, for example, out of, this is 2012, out of Northridge, the average student had 17,000 in debt. Out of Cal Lutheran, the average student had 26,600 uh, uh, in debt. Stanford was 18,800. Pepperdine is like 30,000. Uh, UCs average about 20,000. You want to know why Stanford is so low and Pepperdine is so high? Again, this is all statistics. Pepperdine doesn't give as many uh, full scholarships. Okay? It's just you don't get as much money. Some private schools give a lot of money. So um, I get the impression that if you can get into Stanford, you can get a whole bunch of scholarships and a whole bunch of free, free money. The other thing is uh, if, you, if your family earns under 70000 a year, and it might even be up to 90000 the UCs have a pledge that they will give you uh, a parental requirement of 15% of income, has, they have to be able to say they'll put forward. But I mean, if you're earning 70,000, 80,000, 90,000 in your family, and, uh, and you're still dependent on your family, you can get uh, a, a really good package of financial aid, loan, grants, work study, and scholarships. Mm -hmm. So 
never give up on a school of your dreams. Uh, Harvard gives full pay for people who are under 60 or 70,000. Yeah, nobody thinks about it, Harvard. Uh, and so there's another website that is called, it's, well, I think that's, the, I think I got that from the project on, on debt. And then there's one other thing about if you want to go out of state, you can get uh, the tuition and keep the tuition no more than 150% of in-state tuition, which is less than in California. There's the Western Interstate Commission on Higher Education. I just searched W-I-C-H-E, and they have a, an agreement with California colleges. They were actually trying to steal from all our students. When, when we had they the recession, <laughs> and, they, and they still are. And so I had a student who went to Hawaii. Hawaii is considered the Western Interstate Consortium. And she went to Hawaii on the same cost as it would have cost to attend a California college. And Arizona and Colorado uh, are two of the states that have that same exchange. As a matter of fact, they'll guarantee so. Now, they guarantee that um, if you are accepted into a UC or Cal State, you'll pay the same tuition if you go to the campus, so you don't pay out-of-state uh, tuition. Okay. <laughs> so, can I borrow one Look of at your this. copies of the questionnaire I, of the handout, the student handout I gave you? I don't think we have it. It's in, it's in the <laughs> okay. Take a look here. All right, wow. so now, <laughs> and we're ready for Q&A. This is your part of the program today. Okay, okay. Yeah. So the questions I asked you on the, on the handout is, do you know your educational goals? How many of you know your educational goals? Raise your hands. Like, Hi. Okay, so Be those proud. of you who are here, students, most of you know, even for my class. What, what, do you know or if you're planning to transfer? Or? Um, for now, my plan is to transfer to Northridge. However, um, I'm still uh, like experimenting with different things and very open-minded to different possible career paths. So. Okay, so you're still working on choosing that major? Basically, yeah. But okay. for now, it's uh, history degree at Northridge. Okay, so what are some of, uh, I'd like to hear from some of, the, of you, what are your goals? And by the way, Professor, the people who are holding mics, they're going to, this is Dr. Scarlett Riley, she's our engineering professor, and this is Professor Ronald Wallingford. I'd like to know when she decided she's to be an engineer. She's chair of mm -hmm. the Department of Astronomy, Physics, and Engineering at North Park College, and he also teaches physics and astronomy. So what will happen is when the student answers, if you would take the mic up to them, that's all that's <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that Professor Wallingford didn't, is, is not telling you is that at the time that he was a student in physics at Cal State LA, when he was in the undergraduate program, it was ranked number 16 in the country out of all the physics departments mm -hmm. in the country. Now, he didn't even know that <laughs> himself. <laughs> he just knew that he liked the physics department there. But, anybody, but most people who work in counseling at that time knew that that was actually one of the top ranked uh, physics departments in the country. So that was a, a program that was a hidden gem. That, that's you know, one of those gems that's hanging out there. You just have to look for it. OK, so you're. Um, what I'd like to hear from you about is your educational goals. Uh, what are they? You know, do you know what they are? What is your major? Do you plan to transfer? Do you have any to questions? To which campuses yeah. you're interested uh -huh. in? And if you can't answer the questions, you know, why not? And what are your questions for the speakers directly? Uh, what are your beliefs about choosing a major and transferring? Uh, do you agree with the speakers? And if not, uh, why not? So this is your part of the seminar, so I'd like to hear from you. Um, first person. I'll call on you if you need to. <laughs> Could I ask a question? Um, my, my first one was I was watching a program and they were saying that for us old fuddy daddies, you know, it's like my whole career has been involved with education. But I heard that for the students coming out, 
they need to have their resume always polished up because they'll be changing their career five times in their lifetime. Is that true? Five or to eight. Five to oh, oh my God. Five to eight times. Okay. So careers true. will be obsolete. What they're saying is they're calling it a portfolio career. And so it's have some skills and travel from place to place. All of your 20s, if you get out of school at 21 to 24, all of your 20s may be having gigs, like projects that you do online. You found some jobs that are related to your major, and you're doing them just for a short period of time. You'll be bidding for some of the jobs. That's how you develop your resume. So it's uh, not... It's not like 100% of people now, but that's what they're predicting for the next 10 years. I had a question for the second speaker. You, you named some statistics of uh, local colleges, whether it be Cal Lutheran or, or um, Pepperdine, mm -hmm. and the average debts of each student. Was that for the overall four-year time there, or is that per year? It, it was for the year of 2012. Okay. Yeah, and it was their graduates had that I average see. debt. Okay. And also, when you, you mentioned another statistic about 25% of, of society needs bachelor degrees right now. Mm -hmm. Was that the Society of California, our state? or It's, is that it's a national statistic. Okay. Yeah, okay. they're actually saying only 20% really need the degree, but employers are, are now using bachelor's degrees the way they used to use high school diplomas. So that it could be a job that your parents had when they got out of school, but they got out and they didn't need a degree. Now they're making people have degrees because there's so many people graduating, they can get somebody with a degree. degree and you get a certificate upon completion of the program. Right, let me tie a little bug in your hand. <laughs> sure. Bug, bug. Uh, CSU, uh, hit one of those hidden gems of a program is at CSU Channel Islands, they have a medical imaging program, it's a bachelor's degree. And it's through the biology department there. And one of our former physics professors was their physics instructor for the students in that program. So just something to think about okay. further down the road. Yeah. Or yeah. even interview yeah. Clint Harper. <laughs> 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 Information yeah. interviews really work. And, it, and it's funny that he brings that up because uh, my background, I'm a medical physicist, so that's my actual educational background. That's so funny. That's what I did. You know, I'm going through school at UCLA. So. Is it medical physicists growing? It's a growing field. Uh, it's different because uh, a lot of people confuse it with like biomedical engineering, but it's not. It's more like uh, quality assurance in a hospital setting mm -hmm. where they go through and make sure that the uh, diagnostic or therapeutic equipment is working properly, which is extremely important. You don't want to overdose mm -hmm. the patient or see something that isn't actually there and perform an operation that wasn't necessary. So that's why it's <laughs> super critical that people are you know, looking at that. For me, I, I, uh, it's funny that I got involved with uh, school and teaching, and I uh, fell in love with teaching as I was going through school. Uh -huh. and so I, I couldn't imagine being a medical physicist now because <laughs> all this stuff where it's really, you know, you sit in your little office, you do your thing, and you hardly ever interact with people. So that would have been very boring for me. But, you know, being like in nuclear medicine, if you become a, techni a technologist, you'll be you know, working with a lot of people as you come in and do scans and stuff like that. So okay, well, one... By the way, I want to tell them, the way you get it, Professor Harper is an adjunct professor here, and he's, he was here... Just email him. <laughs> yes, yeah. Clint died. So you can get in touch with him uh, through Professor Wallingford, or just come over to the Department of Astronomy, Physics, and Engineering. Okay, yeah. So if you ask some questions, you just might get some leads <laughs> <laughs> for what to do with the rest of your life.
Look at this. Not all of these are accurate, but some are really right on. This is like. This is from the I Chancellor's website. That one's scary. And PowerPoint would be on the internet. So the websites that we have, even though you have a copy of all the slides, you'll be able to access it uh, from the internet. So you can go to uh, the website that I posted here and hear this little clip about uh, it's the student and not the school. And by the way, he has his degree, was closely aligned with he does, wouldn't you think so? What he does in uh I have a comment. If you go back to the slide on uh, Harvard, okay, let me go back. <laughs> Selective. Yeah. You should see that that's the least uh, accepted school because it's uh, most prestigious. And I, I didn't think much of it because you know I'm being out here from the UC campuses. But my sister is a vice president of a bank, and her, her boss, the CEO of the company, went to Harvard, and he makes five million dollars a year. Okay, so. That's, that's the advantage of going to one of those places. Okay, and it is easier to get into a master's degree or a doctoral degree than it is to get as an undergraduate. So if you have a dream university you'd like to go to, this is really important. You might think about it for graduate school. If you get that excited about your field, you'll be ready for what they are requiring of you. The other thing is I knew a student who was here who was an econ major and his dream school was UCLA, but he had another dream school. Harvard was the other dream school. So the summer before he got accepted at UCLA, he went to summer session at Harvard and he actually took a business law class with the lawyer for Harvard. And he met so many people from all over the world. You do not have any acceptance requirements for summer school. Summer sessions are open if you're willing to pay the price. He had to take out, a, his parents had to take a, out a loan on their house for him to go to Harvard for the summer. But it was, it was an unreal experience. You should see all the people he's connected with, with all over the world who are Harvard people. And it made him dream a lot bigger, although he was just as satisfied with UCLA. <laughs> On the other hand, the Ivy Leagues and prestigious schools have great networks. So they help their uh, graduates. They do a lot more than a lot of other schools do. They help their graduates find jobs. And there's, there's just a network. They, I have my dentist is a graduate of USC. He only hires USC <laughs> graduates, including the woman who answers the telephone as a USC graduate. So they, they help out each other. And in the networks, and that's what you get at prestigious and, and Ivy League schools. It doesn't, but as you know, you can be, and I'm going to show you some slides, you can be highly successful wherever you go, but that is an advantage that prestigious schools have over the Cal States. And you, but one of the reasons is because they graduate fewer students. They have smaller mm -hmm. classes, so people get to know each other. When you go to a large school that has 35,000 students, you know, it's harder to, to, to know people on a... On Every a quarter, you, you meet new people. Yeah. <laughs> now, the other thing about location is, where would you love to have your final job or your first job out of college? Where would you love to work? The, col the local employers look to the local universities. Um, nobody in Iowa knows much about Cal State Northridge, you know, if you want to live in Iowa. Um, what about Wisconsin? Do they have their local universities are best known by in, in Wisconsin? Uh, most of us know uh, Wisconsin-Madison, but it's like the local area you want to live. If you go to school there, you're likely to get a job in the local community.
90% of the grad, uh, the grad people <coughs> in the workforce need to have a bachelor's degree. But there's a number of people who do quite well with their associate's degree. And we encourage all of our students here to earn their associates whether or not they're transferring. And by the way, in uh, engineering and physics, I'm doing grad checks for students. And some of those students are going to have four to five associate degrees. And those degrees look really good on the resume. And if they never graduate from, from getting their bachelor's or something happens along the way, they have their associate's degrees. Uh, how many, I, I, I don't have a TV. I know about this guy from one of my other colleagues in the physics department, Eric, by the way, who told me about uh, this guy. I knew that he had gone, I didn't know that he had been the uh, actor in Malcolm in the Middle, but he's on this really popular show called Breaking Bad. Is it over now? They don't yeah. Oh, funny, finish. He's a local boy. He graduated from LA Valley College. His degree was in political science. It has nothing I wonder to do if he took acting. acting. Valley has good acting program. Now, raise your hand a question or just speak up. And uh, Oprah Winfrey is another person who did not go to a prestigious campus. As a matter of fact, she dropped out with one class remaining for graduation and several years later went back and finished her, her education and finished her bachelor's degree. And I like the, the story about Oprah is that you work really hard for what you want to do. She had her first job in her profession while she was still in high school. And I tell my students, it doesn't matter what major, you can have your first professional job or job that's leading to that before you graduate from college. So when you hear about people not finding jobs or graduating and have bachelor's degrees, in art history, for example, and they're not finding work in art history, it's really because they waited until they finished college before they started looking for the job. While you're in college, you're networking, you're getting excited, you know, you're, you're excited about what you're doing. That's why it's so important you pick the right major for yourself. You're excited about what you're doing. You can find your professional job before you, or at least be on that trail firmly on that trail before you even graduate from college, at the very least by your volunteer and internship work you do. And one other thing is when you graduate from college, it's good timing and bad timing. If you graduate during a recession, or I remember the 2002 period, I was counseling from 1999 to 2002, computer information systems students and business majors. And the poor people who were going for their <laughs> bachelor's degree at that time, they didn't have jobs when they got out of college in 2002. Information systems was not hiring and laying a lot of people off. So bad timing to be getting out of school just when everything is going down. That's why get a part-time job, meet some people who will hire you temporarily for a while on projects, uh, and, and build your resume so that you'll look like the best candidate for the job. It seems like a lot of the presentation has been about, you know, don't worry about this, you know, you have the, so many options. Whereas I'm sort of in the opposite place of I need to narrow down options because I feel like, okay, all of these doors are open to me and I feel kind of paralyzed to decide yeah. and pick because I, 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 was, I was sort of hoping for that and I still feel just as lost and I don't know exactly how to even formulate the So what, I what research have you done? With regard to oh, yeah, to finding all these options. With regard to schools I'm transferring to? Or so major. Like I'm trans I, need, I'm, I want to apply to transfer this year, and I'm still just like struggling to figure out which schools. Which because schools? Because it feels like I could go anywhere, and that's just as that's that's really difficult. And have you sat down with the counselor? Uh, I can't really get a hold of them. <laughs> Do you know your major? Kind of. What, what are you leaning towards? Uh, biomedical engineering, but um, like one of the interesting things about that field is it's also possible to go in as a broader engineering field and then become a BME. That and is I'm not true. I'm not sure then what to pick, so I just have more options, which is just 
kind of paralyzing for me, really. Okay, so you're a perfect student to see me. Yeah. <laughs> our, yeah, uh, really. Our Donald, our Donald Munshower, you want to write his name down. Our Lynn Hastings, those are the, we're the three experts in engineering. And I wanted, to, the reason why I asked you that question, if you knew your major, particularly if you go biomedical engineering, or bioengineering, you said? Biomedical. Biomedical engineering, you don't have that many choices. You have fewer than five choices for an undergrad program. If you pick something broader like uh, mechanical mm -hmm. or electrical engineering, then you have many, many other choices. But we can really help you narrow your, you're so close to, <laughs> you, you don't realize it, but you're so close to knowing what you want to do. I'm pretty sure in one session we could help you narrow down your choices. But what you want to do is make sure you get over to the counseling department early. But you really want to meet with only one of those names that I mentioned. Myself, or Donald Munshower, or Lynn Hastings. Okay. And when do you have to go to the counsel call the counseling center to get an appointment? Well, it are, it's really they, the best time is right when we open at 8 o'clock. Because we only, they on don't our do it campus, online. I know all campuses Ours does don't it online. do this. But Ours on our campus, online. we will only let you book two weeks out in advance, and the reason for that is so that we don't get no-shows. We get very few no-shows by only giving people a 10-day window Memory. to book, <laughs> in which to book. So we don't want to waste our appointment time with people not showing up, so. Okay, um, but I, I, what's your first name? Donna. Donna, Donna I promise you <laughs> that if you show up, and you can <laughs> Uh, even come see me when I'm on Express to get you started. And I'm on Express tomorrow from 12.30 to 2 o'clock in the counseling department. <laughs> oh, by the way, this was uh, one of my classmates. And uh, I have, uh, I don't know if many of you have heard of him, but his, he's an entertainer. And his degree Architecture, is that's different. Yeah, in the old days, they didn't hire women. <laughs> no, so she's, broke, she's really broken through uh, with her acting. I don't know if her psychology degree helps her in that regard. But. And here's uh, Peter Uberoff. I, I don't expect you to know who he is. I included him because he's had some of the top jobs in the country. He graduated from San Jose State University, and he actually graduated with barely two Oh, but there's a reason for that. He started working professionally while he was still a student. So when he was 22, he, he was vice president and a shareholder of Trans International Airlines. <laughs> he got out of college. And uh, here's a person who okay. graduated from, <laughs> Buzz, yeah, Buzz, Buzz from UC Santa Cruz, and, but his work is and he was a teacher for a while. Oh, yes, that's right. He was a teacher for a while. Yes. And here's a, a, a Paula mentions that Paula is coordinator of the EOPS program at uh, Ventura College. Well, the, uh, the universities, the public universities, UC and Cal State, also have EOP, Educational Opportunity, opportunity Programs. They're a little, the name is slightly different than what it's called in community colleges, but the mission is the same. And this is a student who uh, graduated from the EOPS program at Cal Poly Pomona. And she did a, a combination. She went to uh, Cal State, and then she went to a prestigious school. I see, I see. Mm -hmm. And she was, it says Department of Labor. She was head of the Depart U.S. Department of Labor under Obama. They, they do really good with networking with each other, and a lot of the leadership in our country 
I think he went to the University of Chicago. <laughs> Those studying history should know. <laughs> That was Facebook. Lady, it's a double Ivy League graduation. She went, she got her bachelor's from Princeton and her JD, her Juris Doctorate, her law degree from Harvard. But uh, with, and also we know that people who major in math based majors usually have an easier time of finding a job than people who don't major in math based. That, you know, statistically that's true. But what is most important is that you stand out in your career so that you choose what you're good at. And you, this is the time that you're discovering it. And so Clint Eastwood, by the way, graduated uh, AS in business. And then here's someone who worked, worked really hard. I, I heard Rosario you talk Mara. earlier about sometimes how long it takes some people don't go in a traditional five to six years or four to six years to graduate from That's college. a good one. Rosario Marin uh, was born, actually not even born in the U.S., but she's the first and only foreign-born treasurer of the U.S. She took four years to earn her associate's degree from East L.A. College, and then she went on to Cal State L.A. as a part-time night student. She went through a training program at Harvard that's only granted to people who are politicians and local and state governments. So she got involved in local and state government. She is known as a hard worker. She graduated from that program and she holds multiple honorary PhDs. So she didn't get her uh, graduate degrees, but she, her work, hard work earned them for as honorary degrees. And she's someone who worked really hard. You wouldn't think of someone who went to Cal State, even though I showed you all the slides of, you know, of people who work in government who are graduates of Ivy League schools, you wouldn't think that someone from Cal State LA would go on to have that kind of position, but she worked really hard. She's known for her tenacity. So any questions as I go on? I think we're just about done here. Any questions, comments? Um, we want you to, uh, we want you to remember that the most important person who makes decisions about your education process is you, your choices, where you're going. And we included in the presentation, you'll be able to find some links about some resources that will help you. Uh, remember that your professors are great resources too. And uh, if you need to take time off like Tom Brokaw did, it paid off for him. And we have some other information there for you. But we're done. Any more questions or comments? Would you guys agree with the assessment that the world, in America at least, seems to be moving in either math, computers and technology, science, or the medical industry? Does it seem to be gearing <laughs> that direction? Absolutely not. But what would you say that It's it is? where the funding is. So every decade we have different funding sources. In the early, around 2000, maybe 1995 to 2000, there was a lot of funding for teachers. I think in the 1970s, there was funding for more teachers. Every decade, we have a turnaround as to people retire, and we need to replace them, and we're worried about the replacement. So we, we, if we can keep enough people in school finishing the sciences, we will have plenty of people to do those jobs. But right now, we need to give people incentives in sciences and STEM careers and MESA related careers. We need to give incentives by more having more tutorials, more uh, encouragement, because people don't naturally just head in that direction. So that's what the publicity is. Are, are you aware of a demand, uh, if not now, but foreseeably soon, for uh, the humanities department like history and philosophy? Only if you have experience in something. Yeah, so for so example, like we were talking about do doctors are now being, people getting into med school are more given points if they have human relations and people skills and are able to write. That's the humanities majors going into medicine. So there's, it, there's no one cut 
for only these type get in. I'll never forget on a train, I met a guy going to Boston who was from California on a train. I went across country and he was going to Boston College for pre-med med school, for med school. He was a humanities major from UC Davis. And I want to answer your question too. The reason why the med schools are so open to people having non-science backgrounds, they have discovered that when it comes to diagnosing difficult cases, it is the non-science student who's able to make the best diagnosis. So the, the, uh, the students who think outside of the box, who think creatively, who have maybe a more holistic look, so even though they've gone into medicine, medicine is one of those fields that recognizes everybody can't be a scientist or a mathematician, and what do we lose if they were? So they've discovered through their research and statistics that actually the best people to diagnose those difficult cases were not the science majors, and that's one of the reasons why they have a big push for humanities majors to go into medicine. One other thing I want to mention that most people don't think about. Um, if you know somebody who's graduated from a, an interesting college, ask to look at their alumni magazine because there are profiles in the alumni magazine of what's happening with the graduates. I was just, my husband went to the University of Pennsylvania. I was just reading about a scientist at the University of Pennsylvania who got a job in the physics department, but she's a biologist. And what her job is, is to teach, to coat teach with the physicists the influence of light on the growth of cells. Human cells, animal cells, all kinds of cells, there's a whole new field going on and so cutting edge schools have these interdisciplinary studies that you wouldn't even imagine. It wasn't around, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago. So you all are young enough that you're going to be going into something that will totally change five years from now. And so it's lifelong learning. And so you can be a history major, an English major, a political science major, and then you can pick a graduate school to go to once you've saved up for it or found financial aid or got a full ride. Uh, my husband went to his master's degree because he got, a f he got a full scholarship to Purdue. He lived in New Jersey, but he went to, Purdue is in Illinois, I don't know. Indiana. Yeah, I'm Indiana, right. So you don't know what you're going to get next. It's going to open you up to more, a bigger universe. And it's often the people you meet or somebody you read about. And by the way, they have a program. They, for a while, they had a program similar to that at Channel Islands. Okay. One of the physics uh, instructors there, uh, Jeff, I forgot Jeff's last name. Uh, Dr. Reed. Yes, he, uh, for a while, he co-taught physics with a philosophy instructor. And they also, the reason why he told me this, because I have Star Trek stuff in my office, they talked a lot about Star Trek, the physics and the philosophy <laughs> of Star Trek in the class. So that was a philosophy and physics instructor teaching together. Okay. okay. We could call it a day. Thank We're done. You.